Visible. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, good. We're warmed up. That's great. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, let me do a quick couple of, of things of housekeeping. Uh, how many of you are still waiting to send me your first write-up? Okay, don't wait too long. How many of you have already sent me three? Yeah, we got a couple of people already like racing ahead. Um, uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, I will uh, compile a list of what I think I've gotten and circulate that to you so we can make sure that you've sent me what I, I've received what you think you've sent me. Because um, there's enough of you and there are enough papers that it is possible we might lose one in the mix. I'll send around my attendance sheet now also, so please mark that on there too. Um, and with that, let me introduce our, our speaker today. Uh, Kel Larson is uh, the Professor of the Economics and Management of Innovation at the Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. Uh, he and I have known each other since the days, uh, I think around SPRU, uh, the Science Policy Research Unit, lots of acronyms in innovation. This one is in Sussex, England. Uh, and Keith Pavitt, who was one of the leading lights of that institution and has since passed on, was, I think, a very close connection for both of us in our studies of innovation. Um, what Keld's going to do today uh, is talk not only about open innovation in terms of its benefits, but also bring in some of the costs of open innovation. If you look across the sessions we've had so far, most of our discussion has been about how wonderful this is, or how cool it is, or how new it is, or how open it is. Uh, and we haven't had as much discussion yet about, well, what are the downsides? What are the costs? What are the problems? As you all know, in your final paper for the class, I'm going to be asking you for exactly this. Yes, I want you to know what, what's the definition of open innovation, what's its significance, then I want to know the benefits and costs of open innovation uh, and, you know, and what it means to you more personally. So today's talk, I suspect, will be very helpful to many of you as you begin to gather your thoughts uh, for the final paper. Uh, hopefully at this point we're, uh, we're ready to go on the uh, batteries. Uh, and with that, Keld, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Henry, for the very uh, nice uh, introduction here. Yes, my name is uh, Kel Lawson, and uh, I will talk about the benefits and costs of being open for innovation. And this title actually has a couple of uh, hints built into it. Uh, so although I guess that at the end of the day I will emphasize somewhat the costs of open innovation, then uh, I have reversed the title here because normally you talk about cost-benefit analysis, but I talk about the benefits and cost of being open for innovation. And that's, of course, because I believe that the benefits are the dominant ones. But that doesn't mean that we should not look into uh, the cost of doing these things. So we often think that firms can get a lot of free stuff out there. For instance, uh, colleagues uh, at my department, in my research group, have looked at firms who gain ideas from internet communities. Now, it turns out that great ideas have come from internet communities, but often uh, firms have, have they've had to make an investment in order to gain from this. So they put people out there in the fora to uh, engage with the people who debate, because the main problem here is that there's a lot of people in these communities that want to say something, and it's not equally useful. So actually, you have to motivate the right people and you have to find out uh, what are the right solutions to the problems uh, that we have when we engage in, in this kind of knowledge sourcing, in this kind of openness for, for innovation. And uh, my colleague, Lino Starlander, who is now in Berlin, he found that in open innovation uh, or in, in open source, often firms prefer to have a man on the inside. So they actually hire persons who would then uh, contribute to these discussions that goes on in fora uh, in order for them, for the firm, uh, for their em employing firm to gain from the innovation. So of course it's not, it's not a free lunch to engage in open innovation. You need to invest to, um, to select the right knowledge uh, and, and, and thereby gain from it. So benefits but also costs of being open for innovation. 
the open for innovation is uh, taken uh, from a title of a, of a paper that I wrote jointly with Eamon Salter that I will come back to later. We don't call it open innovation, but open for innovation. Um, here's a picture of myself in a, in a uh, somewhat more formal uh, uh, outfit. I guess I was uh, uh, teaching uh, the day that they shot this particular picture because I, in CBS we rarely wear suits, but in this one I do. Uh, as, as Henry was um, hinting before, I did a Master of Science uh, at the University of Sussex in the early 90s, supervised by Keith Pavitt. I did actually a study on the Danish pharmaceutical industry that was later published in a journal called Research Policy in 96. That was my very first publication. Uh, and it was on the evolution of the Danish pharmaceutical sector and how technologies had really led uh, specialization in terms of related technologies over several decades. I did my PhD at Aalborg University, finished in 98, and in, uh, well, I didn't become a professor immediately. I started as assistant professor at the Copenhagen Business School sometime during the last part of 1998. I came to a department where uh, a lot of my colleagues deal with the uh, innovation issues. Uh, and we have, a, we have actually an entire master's class dedicated to the management of innovation and business development, as we call it. So that's basically innovation and, and, and uh, entrepreneurship. And open innovation is kind of like one of our big things. Uh, it's something that, <clears throat> that really gets a lot of attention also in my uh, context. I've been working on open innovation issues since 2002, 2003. So Eamon Salter, who was at the Imperial College London, have were very earlier followers on this. Actually, uh, Eamon, my colleague, knew Hank's book before it was published. So we, we actually, when we were working on the first draft of a paper in 2002 that got published in 2004, uh, that was kind of our first take on, on open innovation. And we, we were basically arguing that when firms choose to source knowledge from universities. It was not only about the fact whether these were high-tech firms, that they were investing a lot in R&D, that they were big firms, as the literature had told us. It was also about having an open strategy in general. And there we took a lot of inspiration in, in, in Hank's book that was just uh, coming out in those years. Later on, we extended that to uh, have a look at, at uh, how, having, how, how um, sourcing uh, among a wide range of uh, information sources, how that could lead firms to become more innovative. And that paper is uh, published in the Strategic Management Journal 2006. Uh, and I believe it's the most cited academic paper on open innovation. Obviously, it's not the most cited publication. Uh, that is a, a book that I think that you uh, should all know. Uh, and the author is sitting in this uh, very room. Um, but uh, we have had some work that that also got some uh, resonance. I'm a research director at a group at CBS, and uh, we have funding from, um, from CBS itself, but also from the Danish Research Council for Independent Research Social Sciences. So even the uh, social sciences recognizing this as a very important uh, area of, um, of uh, research. And here are the picture of, of the people from my group. Not all of these guys works on open innovation, but I think I can count 11 faces or so, but I guess that, that seven, eight of these are actually have one way or another worked on open innovation issues. So uh, since this is not the largest uh, uh, area in the world, although it's extremely important, then uh, we, we are a relatively large group working on these issues in Copenhagen. And what I also like about my group is that actually we have people from a lot of different places with different nationalities and backgrounds. Uh, we have Valentina, she's Italian. We have Jing, she's Chinese. Jens, he's Danish. Christoph is German. Uh, the other Christoph is Austrian. Mayan is also Austrian. Sören is Turkish. And then we have a, a few Danes as well. But we're probably like 50-50 of Danes and, and other nationalities. So that's excellent. And I can also see here that uh, several of you uh, must be, be non-Native uh, Americans as uh, uh, come from, from other countries. So that's, that's, uh, that's very nice. The geographical context of some of the studies that I will talk about is Denmark. Uh, I don't blame you if you don't know my, my home country. It's a relatively small country located up here in the north of Europe. 
it's only around 350 kilometers from the top to the border in Germany. Um, whereas if you take the full length of Germany here, it's about 1,000 kilometers. Sorry for, for using the metric system, but that's what I'm used to. Um, and we have, we, we, we have Italy down here. Uh, my wife is Italian, so we, once in a while we take the big drive of uh, 1,400 kilometers and arrive up here in the north of Italy. So if we look at Denmark itself, it looks like this. Uh, although the distances are relatively small, uh, we, you can see there's a lot of water around, so we have to make crossings over big bridges and stuff like that. In terms of industrial geography, we have over here the capital, Copenhagen, uh, and that's an area where, in terms of economic specialization, uh, pharmaceuticals are very dominant. Novo Nordisk is uh, the largest producer of insulins in the world, but they are nowadays fairly um, uh, diversified companies in, in biotech uh, drugs. They are located up here, north of Copenhagen. Uh, also Lundbeck, they do central nervous system drugs, is a rather a uh, big company, but there are also many small biotech companies here in the Copenhagen area. Over here in the uh, east of Jutland, it's much more, and, and all the way down here, else we have down here is where Danfoss is, is a main uh, mechanical engineering firm that, that uh, produces uh, valves and uh, heating systems and so on. Uh, up here in Ranas, we have Vestas, a major producer of windmills. So basically, over here we have sort of mechanical engineering land. Uh, so, and these are the two, also the two most wealthy areas uh, in the country. Uh, firms in general, uh, with some exceptions, tend to be relatively uh, small and to be suppliers of other uh, firms, except some of these companies I just mentioned. So, five and a half billion inhabitants, rather diversified economy for such a small country. Uh, there's really no sector where there's no activity. There's a high, for European standards, maybe not for US, but for, Euro for European standards, there's a high labor mobility between firms. It's not that fir people tend to move so much, but in Denmark, unlike other countries, such as uh, Italy, that I know through my wife, people are actually not afraid to commute quite a bit, and that's what people do, so people could live down here, commute up to Copenhagen. Manufacturing strength, well, pharmaceuticals, biotech, specialized mechanical engineering, windmills, uh, heating systems, hydraulics, pumps, stuff like that. Of course, today, also with an ICT component, typically built in, as that was a big challenge to Danish firms in the 80s, when ICT got big, that they had to uh, also build in ICT stuff. But uh, if they were not able to do that, they would not survive, because uh, Danish income in general is very high. That translates into very high salaries. So Danish firms find it very difficult to compete on price. Uh, I talked to my colleague, Michael Dahl, uh, who has also given a, a quite a few talks in, in, um, in the United States on the Danish context, and he says, what you compare to is something like Massachusetts. So Massachusetts has about 6.3 million inhabitants, similar level of income, uh, and also has uh, uh, rather strong, a strong science base. I will not compare our science base to that of Massachusetts, but still we have a strong science base uh, in general. Among the service uh, strengths, we are very, uh, Danish firms are very strong in stuff that has to do with sailing. As you can see, there's a lot of water around. Uh, Maersk shipping, they, they have containers that you will see everywhere, also here in uh, San Francisco. Uh, that's probably the biggest firm in Denmark. So it's actually not a manufacturing firm, but a, but a, but a, a service firm. And they're also very active in oil exploration, by the way, because there is oil in the North Sea somewhere. If you take here, somewhere out here in the North Sea, there's oil, fortunately. Uh, we have a little bit of oil, not like the Norwegians, but we have, we have uh, enough oil to be um, uh, self-sufficient at this point in time. So um, even if this is not uh, the United States, it is a country, and it is a, a country that is worthy of uh, study and I will talk about some of the studies that we have done in this uh, particular context. <coughs> right, so now I actually, I, I just took off the, the name tag on this guy. Do, do anyone know who's this guy? Hey, it's John Peter. It's Joseph John Peter, yeah? So he uh, was an Austrian, and la later moved to Howard, and we typically talk about Schumpeter Mark I. Does anyone know what Schumpeter Mark I is? 
it's an innovation model. Since you knew the name, then perhaps also you know the what did he what did, what did he do what did he talk about? He wrote a book, and he was probably the first guy uh, to talk about innovation the way that we talk about innovation today, as co new combinations. So he had he had an idea of in in the 1912 uh, book of uh, of this entrepreneur that uh, would then do great things and establish whole new lines of uh, industries and so on. So what I'm claiming here is that Schumpeter Mark I was, yeah. And he is the one who coined the phrase creative destruction here quite a lot. Also. During this Mark I phase that the creative destruction comes where an entrepreneur can overthrow an established monopoly mm. uh, by striking at the very hearts and lives of the monopoly, not at the periphery, but right there at the central uh, economic uh, reason for being. Yep. That's right. So, so that in, 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 in this way, John Peter is kind of like, a, at least John Peter Mark I was a rather radical economist who really saw these kind of like big swings in the economy where entrepreneurs, one, maybe one entrepreneur gets a great idea and then you get this swarming of uh, other entrepreneurs that would build on the same idea and then maybe totally replace another uh, paradigm. But it was very focused on the individual. So there would be this individual that will get this great idea, and there would be swarming of other individuals, but really no social interaction between these. Although my colleague at Copenhagen Business School, Nikolai Foss, has recently challenged this. He says, okay, it's actually not necessarily a closed model, that Mark I, but that just reemphasizes my point that, that uh, actually there probably was never really a closed, closed model. Already in, uh, in uh, 19, no, I say 42, maybe the book came in 44, for capitalism, socialism, and so on, um, in, in, in Schumpeter Mark II, that was after Schumpeter came to Howard, and he saw all these big manufacturing firms, typically in the United States, and he saw, okay, this model of the sole entrepreneur, ah, uh, maybe that's not the entire picture, so he wrote another book, and this one really describes uh, large firms and how they typically produce more incremental innovation. So now we have a different model of innovation. And actually today we think that there's probably some truth in both of these, uh, that there's probably a combination of these two. We, have, we do have entrepreneurs, but at the same time, we have incumbents, established firms, that would, um, that would also introduce at least incremental innovation. There's a big debate about whether large firms also in, in, introduce more radical uh, innovations. Uh, I think there's some evidence that sometimes they do, <clears throat> but let's leave that for now. But there's been a lot of contributions in our, in our literature, I don't want to go through all of these, that basically have said, uh, like the Nelson 59 paper, public science is extremely important to stimulating uh, uh, innovation in private firms. Uh, Ros Nate Rosenberg at Stanford did a lot of important research on the importance of, of suppliers and vertical uh, disintegration. There was the Spru School that, that uh, became very important in, in the 70s. Project Sappho found that those innovations that included uh, customers, that they tended to become more successful than, than those that did not. So that was a rather, by today's standard, a rather simple result, but it was all very important in establishing innovation as a social phenomenon. Actually, also in Schumpeter Mark II, it is a social phenomenon because it goes on within big firms. Maybe not so often, but it's a social phenomenon. So. Uh, we have had tons of studies that has demonstrated this. So the fact that uh, we have open innovation, I think it's not uh, new to scholars studying innovation, nor is it new to practitioners. So if, if you talk to people, nobody's going to say, we had the total closed model before, and now we, we, we are totally open. Nevertheless, um, th this doesn't mean that... Uh, that this guy up here didn't say anything new. <laughs> in fact, I, I do believe that he said something very important that's new. That is that there are drivers at this particular historical time that uh, tends to speed up this process so that it becomes even more important than it used to be. Uh, so, so now uh, it's, it, it's, it's impossible for firms actually to just rely on a closed model, whereas that was easier before. So there's, there's a strength in emphasis on on how important external sources of innovation are. These drivers include stronger labor mobility. Uh, we don't have these long-term 
uh, employments anymore, uh, software mo movements, open source, uh, all the Richard Stallman stuff and so on and so forth, increased division of, of, of labor. So actually we get a supply of uh, innovation from other firms, also from all around the globe. Uh, and then at least in, in the US, we also got the rise of venture capital. So there would be knowledgeable people who would invest in, in, in high-tech uh, companies. Uh, this is a bit a more mixed story in the in in Europe actually because venture capital markets are less developed than they are definitely uh, here in California where they are well developed. So these things all accelerate the process and and, and really makes it much more important. I think another takeaway that that uh, you can you can take from the book or the several books, but these are the the first one and this is the most recent one, uh, and then there are some in between. That is. Uh, that a firm should think about its degree of openness, not only uh, regarding a specific external source of innovation. So it's not about we, we source our knowledge from uh, an open from um, uh, an open source community, uh, or we source it from a university, or we license in, or we license out. So in, in, in previous research, I guess it's fair to say that uh, that this research has focused on just looking at one channel at a time. Uh, but I think what comes out in the book, uh, in the 2003 book, is really that you have to look at this uh, in a much broader perspective. So we need um, inward open innovation. We need to source uh, knowledge from other sources. But once in a while, uh, it may also be that our knowledge could be used by other firms. And we have to be ready perhaps to sell this knowledge or to exchange it one way or another, perhaps through uh, a license. Uh, so firms today really have to think about managing a whole portfolio of external sources uh, of innovation. Please feel free to interrupt me if you have any comments or questions, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sort of happy. But uh, unless you have comments, I'll just continue speaking. Uh, right. So these erosion factors that I'll just mention briefly that, that is um, mentioned in Henry's book, uh, those would be increased mobility of trained engineers and scientists. That's something he documents that has been going on in the United States. The same is definitely true for Denmark uh, and it's true for uh, the majority of other European countries. Uh, so this idea that you work for the same firm uh, for the entire, entire uh, span of your life, that it's kind of not really the model anymore. Uh, most people uh, that I know, they, 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 not often, but once in a while, if their get, career gets stuck, well, okay, we move on to the next company. It's not such a big deal anymore. Uh, increased importance of venture capital. Uh, at least in the United States, this has happened. Uh, but for sure, there is also a venture capital market in, in Denmark. It's just less developed, especially around the uh, Copenhagen uh, biotech pharmaceutical uh, industry. There are some people who, at an earlier stage of their life, made a lot of money on this and then withdrew and then became kind of like business angels. Uh, I think it's, uh, we, we have seen the same earlier here in the United States as well, that these are people with some experience from that particular industry, and they got very successful, but they sold their company, uh, and now they just have a lot of money, and, uh, and they would, would still like to do something, and they still need to invest this money, so what to do? Well, we make selective investments in, 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 in the, the, the industry that we know about. Increased quality of uh, university research. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, there's been a lot of focus uh, by universities, universities about making uh, uh, the output from scientific research more relevant to firms. Whether this is a good or a bad thing, I will not debate, but I think it's beyond discussion that this has happened. So uh, in as far as we have publicly funded universities, the uh, governments are demanding that this research should be somehow useful to firms. Mm. And I think by and large, uh, universities have succeeded in, in providing this. So there's a lot more tech transfer going on now. Now we, we are not so far from Stanford here. This is probably the, the, the best place in the world for that. Uh, but uh, this has uh, spread. Uh, it's not that it, it's something completely new, uh, at least for, for my knowledge of Danish pharmaceutical industry. It goes back to the, at least to the 1920s uh, in our case. Uh, but today, 
The difference is that it happens on a much, much larger scale. It's not one or two individuals. It's entire departments. It's uh, in the Danish uh, case. It's, for instance, Novo Nordisk, biggest pharmaceutical firms that in invest in an entire new department at the university. Something that has been very controversial in Denmark that they did this because now we get a mix of public and private money and, and some people are not mm, too happy about that. Increased rivalry between companies in their product markets, it's in, in particular in Europe, but also in the United States, uh, there's been a, a deregulation of many markets uh, and a stronger competition policy has been enforced. In, uh, actually in CBS, I sometimes teach, teach uh, I, I, I utilize also my, my skills as an economist, so I, I, I teach industrial economics and I, I talk a lot to lawyers and so on and, and the law faculty at our school and um, it's clear that competition policy in Europe has, been a, has had a major effect because now, as, as opposed to 20 years ago, there is really a united framework for competition policy across the uh, European Union. Uh, and if you ask me, that has been a good thing uh, by and large. <clears throat> but of course, some people disagree. Um, greater dissemination of knowledge throughout the world facilitated by uh, information and, and communication talk technology. It's a lot easier now also to have a headquarter in one particular location, say in California, let's call them, let's call them this company Apple, and then have a set of designs shipped off to China and have the, all the stuff uh, produced out there. Uh, designed in California, uh, manufactured in China, we all know that, uh, that on every product that uh, I can also see some of here in this class. And that, that goes on in, 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 in uh, that, that goes on for, for many companies also also a lot of European companies they they uh, do piloting and so on in uh, for instance Denmark and then these uh, the designs are shipped out <clears throat> and at the same time then we get knowledge centers uh, around the globe and we get a, a whole web of um, in, in fact we get the multinational firm to be the spider in a web of uh, knowledge creation. So here's a good, here's a good news that uh, um, open innovation can provide us with, um, oops, with um, uh, uh, some knowledge. What, what, it, what is it this knowledge can do to us, this, this external knowledge? Why is, why is that a good thing? Can I have your opinion on that down there? Right, and could you elaborate a bit on that, a new perspective? Yeah, sure. For example, I'm by, by bachelor degree, I'm an industrial engineer, and medicine is going to have a totally different perspective and approach to the problem. And so, by the approach them, I'll be looking at my problems in a different way. Right, that's true. So, different perspectives, different kinds of education, for instance. Maybe also different personal, uh, uh, personal background and so on. So, for instance, in a paper by... Uh, by my now, unfortunately, former colleague, Jalas Boyevesen, who just left for Bucconi in, in Milan, in Italy. They, him and Kaim Lacani from uh, uh, Howard, they looked at solutions to very difficult R&D problems and, uh, and contests, uh, cont uh, contests in that uh, context. And what they found actually is that women have a higher propensity to solve these kind of problems. Now, we can debate why that is the case, but in the paper, they argue that, uh, that uh, women uh, provide a different perspective and are, in this R&D context, often marginalized. And for that reason, they ha can have more uh, out-of-the-box solutions. Um, so that's true. Different perspectives, that's definitely one good thing about open innovation. That's one, th one thing that firms can, can draw on. It's difficult to have all kinds of competences within the same firm. If you interact with outsiders, you can get a different perspective. Other, other things that could be helpful. In drawing, in drawing on external knowledge. Right, so that, that would go, go for like getting some knowledge for those who actually use the product to understand the market. I buy that, absolutely. Down there first.
Yep. That's true. So what it what 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 is it that what what can the users do for you? I think it's a very good point. Well, I mean, like, like for example, Google using the way we probably just put it out in the market and then you just provide feedback and yeah. that type of information flow allows them to create products that are um, built better for the user. Right. So there is actually some aspect here, and this is pointed out by von Hibble, that uh, really products are not so well understood before they are used. And companies need to understand this. So he, there's this uh, famo, famous example, which actually doesn't come from von Hippel, but from Rosenberg, where he talks about learning by, learning by using. And it's about uh, production of jet engines and how uh, jet engine producers, they typically over-specify how often you have to change the oil on these engines. They, they over-specify how often you have to change spare parts and so on. But as users get more... They, 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 of course, they, they would like to overspecify. Why would they like to overspecify? Yeah, because we, we don't want planes to crash, right? So, so you, you better be a little bit careful in the beginning. But as uh, the users, that would be the airlines, as they get more experience with these planes, then maybe you can start to change the oil a little bit more often. Of course, you will monitor it very closely and so on, but you only get that experience after some time of use. And actually, the uh, performance improvements of these gen jet engines were really enormous, as documented historically by uh, by uh, Rosenberg. So, so, the, so, so, some experience uh, you can only get by actually using the products. And Rosenberg takes this even further. At at, at some point, these engineers at the airlines they start to uh, tamper with the engines to make them more. And then they, they, they of course, and now they need to involve the producer companies as well to actually improve and produce the next generation of engines. So uh, that, 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 that leads to a second point. First point being that you can only obtain this knowledge through the use of the product. Second point, it's very difficult to transfer this knowledge uh, from the user uh, to, to the producer without uh, direct collaboration between the parties and direct knowledge exchange. Yeah? There's even a connection between Rosenberg and Google because Nate Rosenberg's son, Jonathan Rosenberg, for many years was the vice president of product marketing for Google. And he just very recently retired. All right. Oh, he retired already. Okay, yeah, Rosenberg, he's not getting younger. That's true. He's younger guy. Retired. Yeah, and that's what I understood. Yeah, but I mean, the dad must be pretty old if his son retired. That's, that's, that's my... <laughs> All right, yeah. Yeah. I definitely buy, why would the speed increase? I definitely buy that point also. Because you have many minds thinking about the problem. Right. And we're able to tackle it sort of together in a collaborative way. Right. Also, that leads me to another uh, favorite uh, economist that, that, that's even older than uh, Schumpeter before. That's Adam Smith, the division of labor. You know, if you specialize on something, you know, you cannot, you cannot specialize on everything. And, and there is this, uh, interna this uh, international but also national division of labor where open innovation, I mean, why, sh if you can have a division of labor when it comes to pin, pin, pin making, why can't you have it when it comes to, uh, to innovation? Of course you can. It's, it's a matter of, uh, of finding, establishing the institutions around this, but of course you can have a division of labor. Uh, and and we, all, we have seen numerous of examples of, uh, of this also in, uh, in, 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 of course, in practical life. Yeah. Right, that, that's true. So that's again touch a little bit upon the point with the with a different perspective, and there may also there may be people out there. I think that's also what your comment is alluding to that will have a lot of motivation to move into this uh, because typically it's in their own interest. So these guys who are uh, adding to uh, an internet community, they're typically doing it because these innovations that they contribute to will benefit themselves in the use. So some of my colleagues looked at. Uh, at, uh, some, yeah, actually, I also have a paper on that data set on something called Propellerhead. And uh, Propellerhead is a company, uh, it's, it's a Swedish company located close to Stockholm. And they produce uh, software, a piece of software for, um, for music. 
So you can basically have your own studio at home and you can control it. You can, you can download this and you can have it on your laptop. Actually, some of my friends who are musicians use this uh, particular software. But they have, they have had an, uh, uh, an internet community where, where they have people who are interested in music post stuff uh, and people who are interested not only in music but also in the technology side of it. And, and of course, those who make contributions are typically those who will also benefit from, from getting the new product. And at some later stage, a propeller head uh, often include then the, the new feature into the core of the product. Uh, and I think that's sort of fairly often, it's a fairly used model uh, uh, among, um, um, among firms that works with the communities. Right, so a number of, of uh, advantages. So division of labor, there's a variety of knowledge that cannot possibly be kept in-house. Uh, so if, if, if you're producing a lot of knowledge in your company, then you can be sure that almost uh, all other knowledge in the world is produced by somebody else. And the, the share of knowledge that you're producing as one company, even if you're IBM, is going to be relatively small. So there's just a lot of stuff out there, and it's about getting it somehow in-house. Of course, there's a lot of, it's not, <laughs> it's not easy to get it in-house, uh, but there's just a lot of variety out there. And we know that innovation is basically, that, that is basically new combinations. So in order to get this new com these com new combinations work, we get, need inputs. We need to combine stuff. And a lot of that stuff to combine is, is, uh, is outside. So con uh, context text, uh, specific knowledge from users, direct co collaboration with users. Knowledge that can only be uh, obtained through, uh, through experience with the product and can only go back to the company, or typically can, can go back to the company via direct collaboration. Even the internet stuff often, uh, actually, at the later stage, requires some more direct collaboration. Knowledge produced in other specialized firms, for instance, by, by supplier firms, um, but it can also be be uh, through labor mobility. You can simply hire your competitors' uh, 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 labor. If you don't have too many uh, non-competes in your, in your uh, state, then uh, it's possible to, to hire these key knowledge workers from other firms. Or it might also be that you can align your interests with uh, firms that would sell the technology to you. Th they would do that under, under a, a number of conditions, but of course, if you pay them a lot of money, that's one thing. Then you, it's more likely that you will get uh, the knowledge in-house. Uh, but it can also be that in many instances, actually those uh, that you buy the technology from, they are not your direct uh, competitors. Uh, example, um, Symantec, they are making uh, protection software for laptops. Uh, of course, when then Nokia asked them whether they could get their uh, protection software, then it turned out to be no problem. Uh, it's just a matter of finding the right price because it doesn't really, it didn't threaten Symantec's uh, um, uh, strength in, uh, in in selling software for the for the laptop market. Uh, so licensing in can also be uh, under certain circumstances can be a very important channel of uh, of knowledge sources. Problem solutions from people with a different perspective. We talked quite a bit about that now. Uh, all right, all right, excellent. Because these con these uh, contests they are spreading now everywhere. That uh, uh, people uh, people have really seen uh, uh, the light there. Also, if I give a talk with the Danish business, they really want to hear more about it, how to design this stuff and all, and all that kind of stuff. So that. That is definitely, this is something more new, I guess, that, that uh, Innocentive started with this, but, but a, lot of, uh, a lot of companies uh, have tried to emulate this uh, business mo model subsequently. Then, of course, there's also access to the science base. Uh, so formal or informal collaboration with, uh, with universities is another. You can get another type of knowledge. Uh, I'll come back to that later. There are also some problems here uh, involved in, 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 in actually sourcing that. But scientific knowledge that has been uh, shown uh, not only to, to be directly applicable, such as in the case of pharmaceuticals, where uh, research in universities and in firms is not that uh, different, really, uh, but also in other uh, places, such as in, in electronics, this kind of scientific way of thinking 
has been very useful for uh, private firms. But despite all of these advantages uh, that I, I like to talk about, then there are also significant costs. And that's basically in this pa paper by, by myself and this guy over here from Imperial College London. He's also dressed up in a nice suit there. Uh, I don't know why, because he never does. <laughs> uh, at least not when I see him. Um, but uh, what we basically argue in, in, in this paper is that we can see, see each of the knowledge, uh, external knowledge sources as a channel that, that can, uh, by which knowledge can flow into the focal uh, corporation or firm. Uh, but that's of course fine with the channel. The only problem is this one, that with, associated with each, each channel is a set of costs. So let, let's consider um, the most difficult one is probably going to be universities. Because universities, what do they do? What do universities do? They produce, they produce research. And what do researchers like to do with this research? What do researchers want to do? Publish. They want to publish. What do firms want to do? They want to make money. And do you, I mean, would we make money on publishing? No, not really. I publish quite a lot. I don't make a lot of money. Uh, so there's, a, there's a st really a fundamental tension here that as a researcher, you're proud if you can get a, a, a paper. For instance, this one, this is my most cited paper. I can almost, I, I, I can tell you uh, down to the last digit how many times this is cited and so on. So this indicates that I'm a scientist. Um, so there is this uh, difference between firms and uh, and, and, and universities in the sense that the incentive systems are completely different. In firms, they think much more about money. It's been shown that scientists are willing to accept a lower salary in order to get uh, academic freedom and to publish. Uh, and it's just difficult for firms to deal with that when you have to use them in your knowledge production. So you have some, some, some guys who are really interested in publishing the results that you're going to make money on in the future. So that's a... Now, this is a, of course, we know from technology history and from business history that it's not impossible at all. Firms have been drawing on universities for, for decades and decades. So, of course, it's possible. But it's costly for firms to work with these scientists because they have to, uh, they have to be aware of the fact that these guys have very special properties. Likewise, with users... They, are, they also require some investments. You really need to interact with them. Sometimes you need to put uh, guys on the inside within communities. Um, so each of these uh, knowledge sources, each of these knowledge channels have a cost associated with them. And you need to, for, to, to benefit from any of them, you need to invest resources, uh, company resources in this, that you could have used for something else. All right. Uh, and so what we're basically arguing here is that that if firms don't get this right and invest in too many external sources, then, th then there's a penalty to pay. And then we, we, we find this kind of inverted U-shape between innovation output goes up first, but if then firms, they uh, use too many sources, we, we get quite a rapid decline at the other end of the spectrum. So this is evidence consistent with the idea that open innovation has significant costs. Each channel has a cost. And... Um, and at some point, the cost will exceed the benefits. Fortunately, uh, the uh, tipping point occurs at a rather late stage, so you need to use a lot of sources before this happens. But it will happen. And actually, for our sample of UK uh, firms, actually there's a, quite a big proportion. As far as I remember, it's 10, 15% of the firms that over-emphasize uh, knowledge sourcing. So it's, 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 uh, it's not a small phenomenon. Here we have another uh, competition. It's from DHL. And here it says that the contest is over. Uh, welcome to the DA DHL City Logistics Open Innovation Context. Meet the winners, explore the ideas. So this was just to show that this is really, uh, this is really catching on. Um, but my, 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 my point from before was that uh, we can, we can uh, talk about benefits of open innovation. Uh, these are generic cuts, cost and benefits. So we get a variety of inputs into our knowledge production. Uh, that's a benefit. On the downside over here, we have uh, high coordination costs. So this means that we have actually to 
uh, engage directly with these communities. We have to pu put people out there. Um, and, and of course, our, our, uh, our employees are not superhumans, so they have limited cognition. They can only do so much. Um, and um, we also have um, uh, some um, uh, absorptive capacity problems. Maybe it's difficult for us as a focal firm to understand what goes on in these universities. Maybe it's difficult for us to understand how the users actually think. This requires investment. Uh, and finally, there are also some appropriability problems here that if we work closely with other corporations, then they might steal our ideas. So that's, a, that's a, of course, we can gain from them, um, but we also run the risk that, that we can be t taken over by other and, and faster uh, competitors. If we, if we focused in particular on working with uh, users of innovations, we can, uh, we can identify some specific benefits here. We obtain knowledge that can only be obtained through the use of a product. We get that into our knowledge production. The example was the Rosenberg jet engine from before. Um, but the problem for the, uh, the problem here, or at least one problem, would be that uh, users are often conservative. But by the way, do we know who, uh, who talks about these conservative, uh, who talks about these users that kind of, have you talked about this before in class? Uh, that, 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 makes you, that makes you conservative and makes uh, in, in incumbent uh, firms fail? That it's a problem when... Uh, it's a very famous Harvard professor that talks about this. Very tall Harvard. He's also very tall. He's called uh, Clayton Christensen. So he actually talks, uh, talks about how your users can, can take you captive. And all those firms... When they fail, they know that the technology, we have to go over there and get this technology. And maybe also it's not that difficult, actually, to acquire that technology. Some te students of technology, including myself, perhaps tend to focus too much on the technology. Which, ah, it's impossible to do, to do digital, to di digital cameras. But when Kodak failed, it was actually not because they didn't have the technology. They didn't know where the mar market was. And, and I guess that this, that's really the point of, uh, of Clayton Christensen, that... Um, that, 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 that if you're focused on your current market, uh, then that might make you fail. So users are often conservative. And actually, von, von Hippel's response to this, Eric von Hippel's uh, response uh, from, uh, from MIT, is that, no, we should not focus on the average user. We have to identify some very special users, those he uh, called lead users. And uh, one way of doing that was through an internet community, for instance. But there are other ways uh, through communities that you can identify these users that are uh, a lot ahead of the trend of, of, the, uh, of the average user. But again, uh, identifying these lead user, user guys in the ocean of users is very costly to do. So again, this is a, this is a cost that one would have to pay. And I'll not go through all these uh, examples, but any knowledge source that we have over here, open innovation mechanism, will have an associated set of, uh, of benefits, uh, but will also have costs. Uh, that, that firms have, to, when they want to go for this um, uh, uh, strategy to a larger extent, and I absolutely believe that uh, Henry is right in arguing that, uh, then, of course, they have to think about how they can gain from it. Uh, but also how they have to invest in this to gain from it. Because just assuming that the benefits will accrue uh, uh, is, 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 just, uh, is just too, um, too naive. Right, but I will not dwell at, uh, at the other examples. I, instead, I will, um, I will uh, look at uh, two, different, uh, two different research projects that have been undertaken, both on Danish data and both using... Uh, relatively large-scale uh, uh, data sets. In as far as, I mean, my country will allow because it's only uh, so big. Um, so open you know, innovation practices that can potentially provide knowledge for future products uh, but require uh, attention to internal organizational practices. So the, the point that we're making here is that not only do we have to invest in gaining knowledge from external actors? And we have to think about how do we do that? Also, when it comes to actually applying that knowledge inside the corporation, then we have to find an, an organizational design that facilitates that. And we, we think we have some ideas here 
uh, very broad ideas. Yep. I think this is an extremely good point. Um, so, um, so obviously, um, you 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 can save. It. So, so some companies like to think of the open innovation paradigm as being something where you could get innovation for free. So we basically close R and D, uh, and then we just source all the knowledge, right? So that, that that's a nice thought if 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 you are an accountant in the firm. All that R and D, we don't know what comes out of it, and well, then it, then, then so if, if that, that can be maybe persuasive. Uh, but I think the point is this one, rather than thinking of cutting R&D, you have to think about how you structure it. So you have to redirect some of this R&D towards external knowledge, rather than just being focused on the, on the inside. Whether then on top of that you can save a little bit of money at the, at the margin on R&D, I, I, I don't know. I'm Hank, Henry uh, argues that you can save something there, and, 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 and probably you can because you get all these great ideas. But, but, but it is still, compared to the overall size of R&D, I think it's naive to, to think that you can close down R&D because the, you, you will lose the absorbed capacity. Let me give you an example of this. It's uh, a colleague of mine that works at, um, at the University of, um, of uh, Odense. Uh, he's German. He's called Markus Becker. And he has a, a nice paper, I think, in Industrial and Corporate Change on this. And uh, at a one point before Fiat became, uh, now they're extremely successful again, but at one point it were really going downhill uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Fiat got into the idea, we just outsourced the whole thing. Uh, so they outsourced more or less all components. And then when they came into the plant in Torino, they, 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 they integrated the whole thing. <clears throat> at one point they found out that the dashboard, it makes a lot of, it makes a lot of noise, resonance. And, and, and uh, the problem was, that they put a lot of, in the 80s, they put a lot of cars on the market with vibrating dashboards because they had no idea how they should change it. Nobody within the firm knew about dashboards. So this uh, ability to integrate stuff is really of key importance. Mm. There's another uh, piece of evidence from uh, uh, Stefano Bussoni and uh, Andrea Principe. They uh, have a very nice paper in the Administrative Science Quarterly where they, uh, they postulate the following, that firms know more than they do. Uh, so they, they looked at, uh, again, uh, jet, jet, uh, jet engines. And it turns out that uh, when you look at the range of technologies in which these jet engine producers operate in, then they uh, 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 produce patents in a much wider area than where they supply products. Uh, they, they actually also patent in areas where they, got the stuff, where they get the stuff supplied. They don't produce anything. But their point is this one, that they do it because then they are able to assemble the whole thing. And if systemic problems occur, then they also understa understand the subcomponents. So, so uh, y yes, uh, of course, uh, you, 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 we, we are talking about uh, 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 changing internal R&D, but I would say uh, 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 reducing it drastically, I think, is, 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 is not the case. Uh, and and, 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 and this, this also illustrates the, po the point that you need to invest your own R&D into uh, external attention. Let's call it that. Yeah. Good. Um, okay, so internal organizational practices. So I'll talk a little bit about that. The other one has to do with the study that we did of uh, mobility uh, in Denmark among scientists and engineers. So we are, we are fortunate enough that, uh, that the government is kind of like communist <laughs> because they, they, uh, they collect data on us. They have data on everything. So they know which the, 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 the statistical bureau in Denmark knows where you have worked since you were born, basically. Uh, and researchers can access this information. They also know exactly what education you have uh, and so on and so forth. So we can actually measure the entire population of a country, of where they worked, what their educational background are, and from where they moved and to where. Um, but actually, so, so one should think that if you hire human capital within uh, technology-intensive firms, you should get uh, a bonus in terms of more uh, innovation output measured at patents. But actually, 
we will get back to this, it turns out that you, you, in general you don't. It's only if you have hired university scientists in the past that you get something out of it. Okay, what does that tell us? It tells us that you need to make significant investment in integrating these people that has a diff different background into your corporation. Only after you have learned that, you will really net benefit from it. I'm sure that the benefit, some benefits will accrue from the beginning. The point is that the costs are very high at the very beginning. But I'll talk a little bit more about that research uh, later on. Yeah. So uh, with innovation, I mean, you don't know really what the end result is. You're just doing yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, so, so you really, um, you, uh, it, it will also relate to what I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about now, I think at least, because I, we, we have to, we, 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 uh, of course, it's, it's a, one of the sort of basic first findings of innovation study is, is, would be that uh, innovation is uncertain business. And so we have to accept a degree of, uh, we have to accept a degree of failure. And of course, also open innovation projects can, uh, can fail. And you, and you need to give a degree of autonomy and so on for, for these things to emerge because it's not controllable as, let's say, production of a given unit of output. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about idea generation here. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to manage. And uh, uh, I mean, that's, that, that it, 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 it's a huge field, right? And that's also why we can, in, in my business school and here, can have a lot of professors teaching this kind of stuff because it's just very difficult to, to, to do. Um, but I, I don't have the ultimate answer to that. Uh, we, we try to understand it a little bit be better every day and every, every paper we produce, every study we undertake, every firm we go to, we try to understand this a little better. But I, it, it is a very difficult problem. To, um, but one way of, of looking at this is to look at internal organizational practices. So here we have a famous example of, uh, of open innovation. It's been written a lot about this. Uh, it's Procter & Gamble's Connect and Develop. Uh, and you can see here, uh, you have the possibility here. I have a ready-to-go product or technological offer to PNG. I want to acquire a technology from PNG. So that's both the inward and outward aspect of open uh, innovation in this particular uh, uh, case. 50% of innovation should be de developed outside of own R&D labs. So that's the declared strategy at the PNG. I, I will not talk so much about them because I'm sure other lecturers will be doing that. Rather, I would uh, focus on, on an internal aspect of this. Uh, there's a quote here from uh, Chris Tone. He's the manager of this specific open innovation uh, initiative. So it says here, so uh, what is your system of internal responsiveness? Uh, Chris Tone answers, this is still a journey even for us. We are further along than some companies. And remember, they have been doing this uh, for more than a decade now, I guess. Um, we, we see it as very fluid. Two things that are important in setting up an innovation system that is effective and works well are that even before looking externally, you need good innovation processes internally. Open innovation will not make you a good innovator if you don't have the processes to deal with innovation. You will only Overload, that was another point that uh, Eamon and I, I made in that uh, other paper. You can easily get overloaded. If the processes are not smooth and well oiled, don't focus on open innovation. So that really says strongly, before you go outside, you have to be prepared from the inside. Uh, Burns and Stalker, they uh, produced a classic in uh, 1961, Management of Innovation. Uh, they distinguished between two types of organizations. One they called mechanistic and the other one organic. Um, so me mechanistic is very clear, uh, lateral, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, vertical uh, lines of command and so on, very well organized, whereas organic is more fluid. Uh, indeed, it, uh, it, it um, involves that uh, uh, firms organized in a flexible, decentralized, informal, and highly uh, integrated organizational structure. And Ber Burns and Stalker, they concluded that this type, 
given the uncertainties and given the sort of fluid situation that we're dealing with when producing new innovations, then the organic form is more conducive to innovation than and the mechanistic form. Uh, now, the problem with this research, although I love to read that book, is that it's not the most pre precise term. I mean, so how do you go out and tell a firm to get an organic organization? Okay, get an organic organization. That's the way you. So we have one has a, a value 10 on organic and the other 15. So, so mm, that's maybe not so easy to, to, to address, actually. Uh, so with the 2012 glasses, we don't think that this is the most precise idea, but it was a great idea in 61. And also, that book really doesn't really ad address external uh, issues. So the relation to open innovation is not clear. But modern management, and I would add here, because I sometimes read this, uh, also, modern organizational uh, research in, in organizational economics definitely agrees with the starting point of Burns and Stalker, Stalker, that is, organization matters. So, again, on, uh, innovation is uncertain activity. It is difficult for the management to make correct decisions. So, if, say, if you're a manager, even an R&D manager, if you had to take all the technological decisions that your employees have to, 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 to take during the day, should I go this route, should I go that route, it would be totally information overload. That's, that's going to be impossible. And many times, um, individuals lower down in the organization will have superior knowledge about what way to go because they're really deep down in the innovation detail. Now, a problem that the management will have is, of course, also that sometimes you get your pet projects and so on, but, but I, will, I will leave that uh, now. Uh, but, but, but for sure, the uh, top management and maybe down to the R&D management, it typically will not have the information to make uh, detailed decisions. Of course, you will have stage gauge models and so on. You get a case presented, and at some point, you will be involved in a major decision. But really, you know, the innovation process consists of numerous small decisions that has to be, has to be taken on a daily scale, day-to-day -day -to -day basis. Um, the knowledge needed... Uh, to produce an innovation may also uh, reside in many different places in the organization. I think that uh, also uh, Henry's new book on, on um, open innovation services re really points to this, that it could be that uh, what, what you have to do next is really not maybe a product, but it's a, a new business model based on the same products. Um, so the idea on how to exploit your technology, which could also be innovations, they reside in many places in the organization. It could be in marketing, production, R&D, even in accounting. Uh, right. So uh, we have knowledge, useful knowledge, uh, in many different places. So we argue that work practices that delegate responsibility to, to, to the individuals, maybe in the context of open innovation, it would be delegating responsibility to uh, what has been called gatekeepers, so individuals that are in contact with the uh, external world. And, uh, and here we can refer to the world by Tom Allen at uh, MIT who has focused on, on these uh, gatekeepers. You might have heard about this before. Um, also, one thing is to delegate responsibility to gatekeepers and other uh, people doing research, but it's also important because this knowledge is distributed across the organization that we have lateral communication between functional departments. So we need, if, if there's somebody who has a good idea uh, in marketing because he or she is communicating with the customers, uh, then this uh, knowledge needs to be uh, funneled somehow to the R&D department. If, if they don't get it, uh, they cannot act on, uh, on that idea. So lateral communication is really very important. And actually, for, to get people to work on these kind of things, actually, in, in, in particular, to engage in lateral communication, you need also to, to somehow give them some incentives to do this. Uh, and so they need, to, they, they, they need to get paid. In particular, our research points to the fact that they need to get paid for sharing knowledge. Why would, why, why would it be important to incentivize to share knowledge within a firm? Why, why, why would one not want to share the knowledge? I mean, let's put this question in a different way. Why would you not want to share your knowledge? Let's, let's Power, and Power and politics? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? I think there's some truth in that. So if I know more than the others, I'm in a more powerful position. Right. 
That's it. so it's also it's really a bargaining chip within the organization. They, they, that guy has a monopoly, as as Henry was saying before. That's a good word within the organization. He or she has a monopoly on this knowledge. So if you give that away to your coworkers, hmm, you know you may not, uh, for instance, get the, such a high paycheck next time. So um, and if if the if the um, firm is not able to build a culture of around sharing and rewarding sharing, then uh, um, then you will not get this. Uh, lateral uh, spread of knowledge within the organization. W whether, whether in fact you should be compensated uh, in other ways also for producing innovations, that's a, a big debate on this. I was just, uh, no, I, I think I can reveal that I was a review on a paper for the journal Research Policy where uh, this all, I don't know if it's true, but the evidence seems to suggest that uh, if you engage in open innovation and you at the same time uh, give rewards for innovations, not for sharing knowledge, for giving rewards, then you, then you have a substitution effect. It's difficult for companies, according to that uh, particular piece of research, to, I, I think this should be validated by more studies and so on, but I thought it was very intriguing that if you, uh, if you uh, actually incentivize uh, innovations by individuals within the firm, then it becomes difficult to be open, to benefit from being open. You, you, you can say that every investment that you make in openness is somehow uh, choked off by these incentives. Actually, both of them have a positive effect on innovation, but when they work together, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to fit. So I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do it, but it could have a cost because maybe it leads individuals to focus on their own innovations without drawing on external knowledge. That's what's being argued in this paper. Um, it's just coming out soon. It's, I, I recommend it. Right, so uh, research identifies four sets of organizational practices that are conducive to innovation output, so I've argued this before, delegation of responsibility, practices that furthers lateral communication between functional departments, uh, and practices involve, involving um, knowledge incentives, that is to share knowledge and to upgrade your own knowledge, to invest in your own further education, so to speak. And then final, which is something that we actually don't look at, that is also recruitment and training that has also been found to be very important. Now, in our analysis, we did not include these uh, explicitly because these really have to do with getting new persons into the organization uh, and upgrading them. These, these are more related to the, let's say, the behavior of the uh, existing organizational members. So we, we really focus on the behavioral aspects rather than, so, let's say, the level of education. Um, when you produce empirical models as those I work with, you can only have so much complication. So sometimes you have to, to uh, simplify. Uh, and we, we made that choice in this particular case. Um, there may be complementarities. I, I guess I have also implicitly argued this now, that if you delegate responsibility, uh, then uh, that will be beneficial. But it will be even more beneficial if you have lateral communication at the same time. So you have people down there closer to the actual technologies who make decisions about which way to go, um, sometimes with the use of externals. Um, but at the same time, uh, these people um, are encouraged to engage in lateral communication with other members of the organization. If that's the case, you get more out of investments in both. Right. So we, we propose a, a model here that we also test uh, and so on. I will not go too much into this, but in, in this particular case, we look at interaction with uh, uh, customers. We have a number of items from a questionnaire, and then we see if that helps the firm produce uh, some innovations. In the other end, these are uh, product innovations. Um, and then in between here, we have our organizational practices. Now, of course, we also allow for the possibility that just interacting, interacting with uh, customers without the organizational practice, that, that could have an effect. <clears throat> right. but, but, but that's all an uh, empirical question. And in fact, you, one could say, if you want to, um, uh, to be a bit tough, then this is the von Hippel mo model of innovation. That is, you just need, and I think actually Erika, because I, I have been emailing with him about this paper, that he would accept that probably what he's suggesting is this. <clears throat> but he believes that this is true. It's just not so interesting for him. It, it, he, he's just interested in this, but he accepts that this is probably, that's probably something there that, uh, 
that, uh, that he has not looked at. I mean, just this relationship here, I will not deny to, to move into uh, lead users as opposed to regular users. This is a big research agenda in itself, so I'll not, uh, I should not make, uh, so overemphasize the simplicity of this. Indeed, he has shown that you can have a very successful career, uh, one of the most successful careers in, in innovation studies on, on exactly this. Right, so what we did, we uh, sent out a, a questionnaire to the 1,000 largest uh, Danish firms in 2000. Uh, so these are probably by American standards, uh, uh, large and medium-sized companies. Uh, they are not, they are not extremely large companies as such as in the United States. Um, they had an average of 1,811 1, employees. So they are, for Danish standards, quite big companies, but the smallest in our sample are around 350. Uh, so this means that there are some uh, corporations with, uh, let's say, Novo probably has more than 20,000 employees, assuming that they responded. Uh, I think they, they, they have a, a history for doing that, so they probably did. But they are, they are I, I can't actually remember whether they were in the data set. So we got a response rate of 21%, uh, which is not fantastic, but fine. It turns out that, it's, that, that this sample can be considered representative in the sense that uh, there was no difference in terms of uh, age or industry or this kind of stuff uh, between those that responded and those that did not. Of course, we do not know whether there would be a difference in how they answered to the questionnaire, because we, we could maybe have uh, forced some to answer and so on, but uh, we didn't do that. We just said, okay, we want to be sure that it's representative in terms of geography, in terms of, uh, in terms of size, and so on. And we got the CEO, and in some cases, the HRM uh, manager, or in fact, the R&D manager uh, to respond. And um, this colleague of mine, Tom Peterson, he can do something called structural equation modeling. Um, <clears throat> it's a technique that, uh, that I came to believe during this research before, before so I thought it was, uh, I didn't believe in it, uh, but actually I didn't do the modeling. I, I normally work with sort of normal regressions. And, uh, but the thing is that uh, when, I, when I got the data set, then I, um, I replicated everything he did using normal regressions and the results are more or less the same. When I did that, then I started, okay, it's probably not totally mumbo jumbo. All right, so here's our model. Again, what do we find? Well, actually all of the hypothesized relationships are are, um, are, are, con um, are confirmed. So that means that we have a, a set of complementary organizational practices in here, but the relationship is uh, fully mediated. So this means that, th that there's not this direct effect. Only firms that had in place uh, these kind of organizational practices were able to benefit from, from, um, from open innovation in the form of interaction with customers. So, uh, and of course here the story is that, uh, that uh, setting up this internal system of management is something that requires a lot of attention. It's, it's, it's not a, uh, you, you really have to look at your internal structure as the guy from P&G said, before you go out and start to be open. You have to have the system or you have to work on it as you're going. I mean, probably it's not like this. Okay, wait another five years before we start to be more open while we restructure the organization. Probably you should do it simultaneously. But the point, the, the main point is that you need to work along these lines. Delegate, have practices for delegating responsibility, internal communication, especially lateral ones, and then to have knowledge incentives for upgrading own knowledge and for, for um, sharing knowledge. Uh, here's, um, here's, here's, a, here's a site from, uh, let's say, a real firm. It's an American uh, textile company. Uh, it's an old one, and it was, it, it's from a paper published. Uh, it's a qualitative paper from Organization Science 2001 by Deborah Doherty. She called the company Texco. It's not called that in reality, but uh, um, she has this quote <coughs> where a marketing manager says, I came to this business seven years ago. It had a traditional organization with director of development uh, of technology and a bunch of engineers and a good marketing and, and a marketing manager and salesman. The salesman would go and find customers and get a quote on a product on a product and bring it back and drop it in a box and the engineers would pick them up and do them. The salesman would go back to the customer and show it to them and say, is this okay? We were doing hundreds of these costings and very few of them would get to the uh, sample stage and of those very few succeeded our hit rate was very low. 
everything the engineers worked on was screened through salespeople and were, they never heard the voice of the customer. <clears throat> okay, now, so this is after they restructured the organization. Now the new ventures teams develops new markets and innovations and pull, pulls in people from across the organization. So here we have the lateral uh, part. Consi consider the uh, weaving, dyeing, and finishing plants. We help them to understand the needs and wants, do the QFDs, that's the quality function deployments, have manufacturing people help them with the QFDs, and the development engineers take the process engineers to several customers. So now uh, we have delegation, where also these uh, engineers who were pr prior sort of like in a silo in an R&D department, they go to the customers and talk about uh, the product. So I think this is an illustration that uh, we are that that our story is at least consistent with what goes on in uh, in real life out there in textiles. But I think this is fairly general. Of course, our model can be strongly criticized. It simplifies and does a lot of things. Uh, but but I, uh, organization is really an area that we need to look more. Uh, much more close at also in the context of uh, open innovation. All right, second example, and this would be a bit faster. Inward mobility of uh, university researchers. Uh, we have here uh, uh, the usual guy, Henry. Uh, he says in the book, one of the erosion factors that has led to the demise of the closed paradigm, that is the one that preceded the open paradigm, is the in increasing availability and mobility of skilled workers. This factor has many causes, and he goes on to talk about what those are. The supply of well-trained, knowledgeable people expanded tremendously during the post-war period. This, represent, this represented a large increase in the raw material able to produce useful knowledge. So that's a characteristic of uh, all developed economies. And also th those that came from the back, including Japan, that the amount of people um, uh, with a university degree in particular, that grew tremendously. Uh, and, 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 and that has really, uh, I think there's no doubt that this has, uh, has helped in, in, in cre creating the level of wealth that we have at this point, despite the crisis and so on. Um, further, Henry says, beyond knowledge generation uh, to connection, uh, innovation thinking changes the role of the research functions. It expands the role of internal researchers to include not just knowledge generation, but also knowledge brokering. Okay? Uh, previously, researchers simply added the knowledge setting uh, in the silos. Uh, today, they are also charged, uh, charged with moving knowledge into and out of the silos. In this new role, knowledge located from outside may just be just as useful as knowledge created from within and should be similarly rewarded, right? So um, there's another quote from the Bogue book here. It considers Merck. Merck accounts for 1% of the biomedical research in the world, which is actually quite a bit for a private corporation, uh, to tap into the remaining 99. But even, I mean, even such a big corporation, it is true that the rest of the knowledge is created from the outside and to exclude you from that would be plain stupid. So to tap into the remaining 99%, we must actively reach out to universities, research institutions, and companies worldwide to bring the best technology and, and potential products into Merck. The cascade of knowledge flowing from biotechnology and the unraveling of the human genome, to name two recent developments, is far too complex for any one company to handle no. And this is even considering Merck then it probably does not get much bigger. Um, so one way of tapping into this research is through labor mobility from universities. We have one of those here. Um, in this recent research paper, we look at the inflow of researchers from other organizations into for-profit, as opposed to the universities that are not for-profit, into for-profit private firms and see how that affects private firm innovative outcome. So we look at uh, inflows of people, new graduates from other firms and from public universities. And our benchmark here is stairs. That means for, uh, individuals that already worked in the focal firm, but they needed to have a, a degree at a, certain le at a certain level, um, at least a master's degree. So this is in, uh, in Denmark, it's a five-year degree to be considered researcher. So, um, 
actually bachelor would not be enough in this particular case. case. So we have two types of groups here. Here we have the business. They wear, uh, they wear ties and smart business suits. And up here we have the uh, researchers. Uh, they are not so, maybe so concerned about exactly how they look, but also because they wear sort of like white dresses on the outside of their regular clothes. And they are much more uh, concerned with, the, with this, that is to find out about stuff. So uh, what we say in this paper is just following the literature on this uh, area, that is Dasgupta and David, they said, okay, you can see, we can see many differences between business and universities. One of the, them is how they are dressed. <laughs> but there are other more fundamental aspects of this also, the Skupta and Davy argue. And for them, since they are economists, that has to do with incentives and institutions. So they say that these two spheres, they differ because of the nature of the goals accepted as legitimate within the two communities of researchers. Okay, so if we have to go extreme, that's money and recognition, peer recognition due to excellent research. It is the norms of behavior, especially in regard to the disclosure of knowledge. So we agreed before that uh, researchers in universities, they like to publish. What do firms do, if they are high tech at least? They patent, right? So they also publish, <laughs> but they publish to protect so nobody else can take the knowledge. The other one, they just, they just, they just publish it so that it can be used. And then finally, also the reward system within here. So one uh, rewards a pecuniary success, the other one re rewards scientific success. Uh, academically trained scientists, they tend to have a strong taste for science. So people like Scott Stern and so on, they have shown, and also Roche and Sauerman. More recently, they have shown <clears throat> that actually people who are researchers are giving up income to become researchers. Then you can speculate, why are they doing this? Uh, they argue, these researchers, that they have a taste for science, they have a preference for basic research, uh, for freedom in choosing research projects, and for actually, at the end, to get the recognition for disclosing these research results. Industry often need these, uh, these uh, scientific insights, in, in particular pharma, but also to a degree uh, electronics and, and, and other industries, but they uh, at least uh, Gittleman and Kogut, uh, they show that they do not gain directly from, from uh, making contributions to great science. So actually, uh, patents, they don't tend to, to cite great science. So th there's no link between elite science and elite patents. Well, there is a link between the two also in terms of the citations, but not between the elite. So uh, we have a mismatch here. It's, it, 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 it's just not easy. Uh, we have a, maybe at best dance partners, but, but they're not, they not always aligned. So these observations su suggest that implying university scientists in industrial uh, settings is challenging and also expensive, not only in terms of just paying them the salaries to, to go into the firm, but also in terms of integrating these individuals with different incentives, with different, um, uh, with different norms and values. All right, so we, what we did here to... Um, uh, to examine this issue is that we took uh, EPO data, and this is not the drug that you can take to enhance your performance. This stands for the European Patent Office. Uh, we have European Patent Office data on our Danish firms. We have over here something that's more unique than that. That's what's called IDA data. Uh, actually, Ida is a girl's name and in, in a, a woman's name in Danish. So, um, but it's also a very nice database, and this is the database that tracks all individuals in the country, what kind of, uh, where they have worked, um, what kind of uh, training they have. Actually, you can, you can find out what high school you went to and stuff like that if you really want. Um, now, of course, to actually work with this data is a little bit more hard than this because it, it, it comes very coded and so on. So, so, so there's some barriers to entry, but when, when you can crack the code, you get going. And then we link this up via something called FIDA. Uh, actually, the F here is just for the firm version of EDA. So this is a way that we connect the individual data to the patent data through a database on individual firms. Uh, we took all Danish patents, that is, patents uh, taken out by Danish companies, 78 to 2004. Applicants are linked by a unique number. We got them 95% matched. We have 16,530. 
one firm year observations, less than, slightly less than 6,000 firms. But of those, only 292 unique firms patented in this period. So patenting is not uh, the most common event among Danish firms. Uh, and we have um, 2,535 citation unweighted patents and 4,876 citation weighted patents. It, it doesn't really matter. That's, that's not so important. If you're using any of these measures, will produce the same result, more or less uh, identical. So findings. Joiners from any other organization contribute more to innovative activity than those who stayed within the firm. Uh, so this is confirmation of earlier literature by uh, um, uh, people uh, such as uh, Nurkar and uh, Rosenkopf and, and people like this who says that you can one way of uh, overcoming sort of local search traps would be through alliances or it would be through hiring people. So actually we confirmed that result, but it's not new. Uh, among the joiners, Newly hired university researchers give a stronger contribution to innovative activity than newly hired recent graduates or joiners from firms. Uh, so we argue actually that joiners from firms, they can offer something very similar to the stayers. So they, are, they don't offer so much uh, opportunity for recombination. And recent graduates, well, while they offer science, they don't offer deep science, not very experienced science. So it's, it's actually not surprising. But we only get this effect when firms have a recent experience in hiring university researchers. So we, we say in technical terms that this effect is fully mediated by prior hiring experience. So only those who have learned to deal with these individuals are able to gain from it. And they actually gain quite significantly, especially when it comes to university researchers. These are actually, if you look at, at the typical uh, person you hire, it's a person that has done a postdoc at a university after PhD, a three-year postdoc. Then those who don't get tenure, they would then go into private business. So actually, this w would suggest that our results are conservative. So probably it's not the strongest individuals that goes into the private firms. Probably it's those that did not get tenure that go out. It doesn't. Th those that don't get tenure, it's not that these are, are bad people. These are probably very, very. If you look at the across the population, these are very skillful individuals. That's just only also in Danish universities, so many tenure positions. Um, we find that firms' recent experience in hiring university researchers, that also enhances the effect of newly hired recent graduates' contribution to innovation. So one channel that has been found in the literature is this one, that, that there is a network effect. Uh, early studies by Gibbons and Johnston, they, f they found that uh, often university graduates, if they have a technological problem, what do they, they can't solve, they can't ask a colleague within the firm, what do they, who do they call? Who do you think they call? Who? Friends at the university, that's right, maybe old professors. Uh, may, and, and often this old professor will not be able to give you the solution, but he might know somebody that could give you the solution. So he or she will direct you to, to those individuals. Uh, now, of course, uh, this, we take this as an indication that firms who have, have recent hiring experience, that they are probably better at sending, at connecting up with the mother universities somewhere out there. So I also think that that results make a lot of sense. Overall conclusion, university researchers potentially help firms become more innovative, but these researchers are costly to integrate in the research process of four private uh, uh, firms. So, uh, so also here is an absorptive capacity story. You need to invest in your own absorptive capacity. And you also have to take, when you make your first hiring, you have to think of this as a lengthy process. It's not going to pay off uh, tomorrow uh, because you have these integration costs. So you really have to have a longer term vision on this when you, when you go for this particular channel. And this is my final uh, slide here. Um, so for those who, who uh, who work with this in practice, I think it, 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 it's a good tool to do something very simple. That is to take each of the possible channels that one can think of and may be useful for the particular context of the firm and list them. And then try to think of, okay, what can we, even if we cannot quantify this, what, what, what could we potentially, uh, in qualitative terms, get out of this? 
And what would the cost and the investments be on the, on the other hand? Uh, and actually, it's my experience that uh, at least Danish firms, uh, at this point in time, because they have uh, read uh, Henry's book and other books and so on, they, they, they are very focused on this part. But they, um, they are just... Yeah, they're starting to think about that. Ah, wait, ah, that's right. I mean, we had some problems in collaborating, especially in Denmark, but maybe that's particular to Denmark, but, but I'm not sure. Uh, actually, I don't think so. Uh, that is that they have problems in uh, collaborating with university researchers. They, all of them, all of them, I, I went to this recent, I gave a talk at the Danish Industry Association, and more or less all the R&D or C CEOs mentioned this as being a problem. Some of them had good experience, but even those with good experience had some problems in communicating with uh, or using researchers, uh, uh, university researchers. Some of them that were not so successful, hey, they are lazy, they don't want to do, they don't want to work on this project and so on. But I, I, I don't think that they, um, those, those managers of those firms, I don't think that they had really thought of, it was my opinion that they hadn't thought about, but who, what, what animal are we inter interacting with here? What do these guys want to do? I mean, okay, you're interested in making money for your corporation, but maybe that's not in their objective function. So, um, but whereas others are much more developed uh, along these lines. All right, this is actually my, uh, this is my last slide. So, uh, Great, Cal, thank you very much. <laughs> we have time for a few, uh, few questions or comments. And I'll try to get the microphone to you so we can capture them uh, on the video. Um, my question is about the uh, researchers we are trying to integrate into the companies. Uh, why just why can't we keep them in the university and work in that way just to make sure they don't publish whatever they find right away? It's kind of a taming them. Or <laughs> what's the point of integrating the researchers if that's such a costly thing? Right. I mean, I, I think there would be uh, at least two answers to this. So the first part is this one. I think that you, if you are a larger science-based corporation, you, you probably need to employ researchers, and uh, not least <coughs> with the reason that you need absorbed capacity within the firm actually also to read the journals and so on, because a lot of new discoveries with potential, they, they are published in the journals. So for that reason, you need, you need, you need to hire uh, these, these kind of people. And there, I don't think that uh, recent graduates will do. You really need people who uh, have has as, as, as least a PhD, but also maybe some postdoc experience to, to, um, to do exactly that. There's, there's also the other part, that is, that especially for um, uh, US corporations, but I, it also happens in Denmark for some of the smaller biotech startups, that these firms work, they set up like internal universities, so they, they will actually allow uh, researchers to publish and to, in, to, to, to a degree continue their scientific career when they move to the uh, private firm. Of course, you have to restrict this somehow because you also need to get, you need to exploit, not only explore, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, also the paper, I, I cited a recent paper in research policy by um, Sauermann, uh, and what was the other guy it was, um, Was, yeah, no, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, but, but that, that, um, well, one thought too is what is the motivation of the university researcher to do the work if they're not working at the company and getting what presumably is a better salary or some other attraction if you're constraining their ability to publish but keeping them at the university? What's the motivation for the university faculty member? And to, to put a finer point on that, the only faculty that will accept that will be the ones who need the money because they can't get the funding from the normal sources to do their publishable research. So you get an adverse selection effect. And so the real people you want are the people who, have, who can get the funding, can do the research, and you're trying to get the best people. And so how do you attract them to the company? Mm. Uh, as some of the research you saw, saw here was sometimes what they'll do is they'll promise them continued freedom to publish. You can still go to the conferences. You can still write your papers, et cetera. We just ask that you run them by our legal counsel before you publish them. Uh, and so forth. But you have so to, sometimes uh, they have to delay publishing and stuff like this. But in exchange, maybe you'll get a higher salary and stuff like that. So, so that, that there are these trade-offs for, for individuals. It's a paper by, by Roach 
by Mike Roach and Henry Saum and 2010 research policy that, uh, that, that goes into this uh, issue. Yeah. The thing is you, you can't treat them like vendors. University faculty are not contract researchers, they're not vendors, and any attempt to treat them that way will end badly for, for one or both parties. On the, on the other hand, if you look at it from the point of view of uh, university researchers, then some of the research that they are undertaking is extremely expend, expensive to, uh, to undertake. And sometimes you want to, uh, to um, collaborate with, uh, with the firm because they simply provide you resources. Maybe you stay within your university or you sometimes go out to the firm. Uh, and in that equation, you may be willing to uh, trade off a little bit of delay in publishing and so on to get those resources because maybe you would not be able to, to uh, do that uh, otherwise. Other comments or questions? Uh, hi. So uh, in your study, you, you, you equate innovation and patent, mm -hmm. right? And then you look at, uh, among one driver, driver of the joiners, which quality of, of joiners is a dis discriminator of good innovator or bad innovator, or I mean, good yep. or less good, right? Is that the biggest discriminator, the joiners, the quality of the joiners, or you just wanted to focus on this one? Is this something else that discriminates innovation within this company? Oh yeah, I mean we I, 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 uh, we, we have a lot of other control variables in. So these are these are these are net effects on top of R and D investments and, and and other stuff. But actually, the benchmark in the way that we econometrically estimate this is uh, is the stairs, and then and then we add the other types of human human capital on on top of that to see the difference. Yeah. But it's it's true that we, of course. So this is a. Uh, the, the, this paper takes a sort of a fairly uh, standard, it's a fairly standard model, it's, it's, it's a production, it's a knowledge production function, and uh, then we add these additional components to it and, it, it, and this has additional explanatory variables in addition to a lot of other variables. Um, I have a question about the open innovation cost. Have you actually asked them um, the experience of open innovation practices. So if, if they had gained more experience of uh, practicing open innovation, I guess the cost can be uh, lower. Um, and also if they are dependent mm. among the ecosystem, I mean, the cost can be lower as well. And for example, in Germany and Korea, I mean, um, the SMEs are very dependent on the large companies. and they, they've been always, uh, you know, collaborating, and in that case, open innovation costs can be lower than independent companies, you asked, in Denmark, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a very good point. Actually, for the results I referred to by myself and Eamon Salter, that we, we do not address this issue. So we take, in that analysis, for, for data reasons, we take a fairly static approach. So that is, at one point in time, do you, do you have too few or too many sources of innovation? But I think your, your, your point is well taken. As firms get more experience over time, maybe, um, and this is a hypothesis that we have not tested, but I think it's an interesting one, then maybe you will be able to, I, I would suspect that you will, be, you will be able to handle more sources. Uh, but I, even then, I, I will argue that there will be a limit to this because of uh, it, 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 coordination costs will just be, 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 be very big at the end of the day. But I would uh, suspect that as you learn to work with each of these sources, you, you can also you can engage in being more open. That's, a good, that's good news for us as open innovation researchers. Let me take the uh, opportunity to ask a question of my own, if I may. Sure. Uh, one of the areas that uh, is sometimes uh, studied in these areas is the role of intellectual property mm -hmm. and the open innovation uh, processes that we've been talking about with your talk today. Uh, if we look in an area like software, where in the Europe you don't have software patents, whereas in the US, the USPTO does grant software patents, do we see more innovation in one region than we do in the other, controlling for other factors as a result of the absence of or the presence of intellectual property? And, uh, since you haven't already done that study, I'd be interested in your conjecture and also just how you think about intellectual property in the context of open innovation more generally. Right. 
So th this is a very con complex issue, and in fact, I, right at this moment, I, I'm, I'm working on uh, on a paper on on, on th that relates to uh, to this issue. So it's something that I, I've I've done some uh, thinking about. There is yet no study that compares Europe to the United States in, in this. Uh, in this sense, and in Europe, uh, th there is a, there is some degree of protection of uh, of uh, software, in the sense that it used to be in the United States. So that if you have a tangible asset that's linked to some software, you, you you can patent that. But you cannot patent software per se in Europe. So in that sense, there is a real difference between the two regimes. Um, I'll come back to the uh, open innovation part, but I, the, the way I understood it uh, in the U.S. and, and this is actually uh, researched by another uh, Berkeley professor, it's Bronwyn Hall, um, and, and what they found is that initially in the United States that there were de detrimental effects of this, of uh, introducing software patents, uh, but that there was a story in her more recent papers about institutional adaptation, so that over time uh, firms got used to uh, working with intellectual property also for the software firm, so these these effects uh, disappeared. Now, now for open innovation, I, I, I think it's it, it's a also it's a complex it's a complex uh, issue because on the one hand, uh, markets for technology, as are argued by SEC Aurora and other people, they really rely on having patents because it's very difficult to exchange ideas. I guess you all know about the arrow uh, paradox that if I want to sell an idea to you, you will naturally ask me, what is your idea? And I tell you uh, about my idea and they say, okay, but now I'm, now I'm not paying you. So we, we, we have this kind of, but if I have a patent, uh, this situation is different. You, you, you know about my idea, uh, but you still have to buy it afterwards. So, so it does help. Uh, it, it helps especially smaller firms that uh, maybe specialize in producing knowledge and, and have, have no complementary assets for instance, in terms of production or marketing or, or, or whatnot. So I think I, I, there's probably, there is that aspect to it. Uh, but having said that, uh, there's indications in our own research that when, f when firms become extremely focused on uh, IP issues, uh, then they may um, shy away from collaboration and they may also scare away uh, potential collaborators. They send a signal that we will hunt you down if you steal an idea, and if you have, if you're in a collaborative situation, stealing an idea or not stealing it is, is maybe um, not as clear as one would like it to be because you're really co-creating. Uh, so, so that might send a signal that that um, that you are not the ideal partner for open innovation. So I think that definitely firms can overdo uh, their um, their um, IP strategy. And in that sense, they can uh, they, they they will um, remove themselves from opportunities that has to do with uh, that, that comes from open innovation. So so I think that as uh, as everything, it probably the the truth is somewhere uh, in the middle. Uh, so IP, yes, but uh, IP um, unfolded to an extreme degree or to a very high degree that that will um, cause difficulties in open innovation processes. So another one of those inverted U's that you showed us. <laughs> Maybe something like yeah. that, yeah, yeah. So next week, we're going to have uh, open innovation in the pharmaceutical sector uh, with Stephen Friend from Sage BioNetworks. Two weeks from now, we're going to have Kareem Lakani from Harvard Business School uh, talking about open innovation research as well. Please join me in thanking Keld Larson. Enjoyable? I like your answer about the IP. I